We're going to read God's Word together. Pastor George getting ready to come this morning. Now we're going to read from Matthew. Matthew chapter 9, we're going to read from verse 10 right through to 13. Now it happened, as Jesus sat at the table in the house, that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Why don't you welcome Pastor George as he comes this morning. Uh, Thank you, Scott. Thank you, young man. Good morning, church. Please take a seat. Thank you, sir. Uh, Let me just add my uh, welcome to everyone that's here and also to the mums. Happy, happy Mother's Day. You guys are absolute legends. Um, I thought, what what would I like to do for mums today? Something something a little special. Uh, So I I actually wrote you a poem. Believe it or not. I don't find this on the internet. I actually wrote this. So if it's horrible, (laughs) I take the blame. Would you like me to read it to you? I, I know you do, yeah. You're busting, I know, I know. I actually wrote this poem. Some of you are laughing up there. Stop laughing at me, Mark, okay? So it's not that funny, bro. You can laugh after the poem or during. That's right, can you provide some atmosphere for me? Thank you, guys, I appreciate it. So Now I'm nervous. <laughs> All right, this is for you, mums. Today, we say thank you for all that you have done, for the hugs and the kisses you've given your daughter or your son. We thank God for all the care you have shown us through the years, for the closeness we have had during the laughter and the tears. Of course, I've just, uh, my apologies. This is technology. Through the laughter and the tears. You've tied our shoes, made our bows, and tucked us into bed. You made our meals and drove us around, even though you wanted to be doing something else instead. A mother's work is never done. That's how the saying goes. Washing, cleaning, scrubbing, working, and the dreaded stepping on Legos. (laughs) Who can ever compare to the patience that you have so graciously shown when we tantrum or when we scream or even when we bemoan. Mum, we may not always end up seeing eye to eye, but regardless of that fact, you still teach me how to fly. Whether you are our natural mum or someone just as special, today we say a huge thank you, and in you we truly revel. Happy Mother's Day to you all. Was that okay, Mark? Mark, that was okay? That was not too bad? Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys, for the atmosphere, too. That, that helped a lot. I appreciate it. <laughs> Let's thank our worship team for all that they do, honestly. Week in, week out. Tuesdays. <clears throat> on Tuesdays, hear the rehearse here really early in the morning on a Sunday, especially in winter when it gets a little tough to get out of bed uh, at 9.30 to get the church at 9, by 9.30. Uh, these guys are here really early, so I appreciate them. But not only what they do, but also what they bring and who they are, and so I want to, uh, that, was a great, that was a great atmosphere of worship just then. So thank you so much, guys, for doing that. But uh, Mother's Day is a special day, and, um, and it's, a, it's a time to remember mums, and if, you know, we normally do our Mother's Day sort of celebration on a Saturday, because Sunday is such a big day, obviously for a, for a pastoral family in that regard, and so, um, so we celebrated Heather yesterday. And um, uh, do you remember, I don't know if you remember, but uh, I, don't, didn't, I don't like cats, right? You remember this. Um, and you remember at, at, um, on, on, at Christmas, I bought Heather a cat. Remember that, right? Yeah. And um, it's still alive. I just want you to know it's still alive. It's, it's, it's actually prospering. It's, it's growing. Stop. Andrew, I know you're looking at me because it was your fault. I got the cat. I oh, know, you and your wife. Uh, and, <laughs> and so... Um, so we, 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 you know, the, the cat's lovely. Cat's name is Armani, of course. You know, it's Armani, yeah. And, um, and then um, come uh, Friday, uh, I don't know what happened on Friday. 
uh, I was out to lunch with Heather, and um, all of a sudden, I'm looking for cats on Gumtree. <laughs> by, <laughs> someone's proud of me over there. And then um, by um, 9.30 that night, I was at Kingston Park Raceway. There was a house behind Kingston Park Raceway, if you didn't know. And I was asked to drive down in this really dark property, down the end of the property, go to the end of the property, turn left at the end of the property, and there's a house down there. And so I decided I wasn't going to do that at 9.30 at night with my wife in the car at, at, at a cul-de-sac, pitch black, across the road, looks like swampland. Um, and so I waited outside the front of the house in the car. So, so I want you to picture this. Arab man in a car, in a cul-de-sac, okay? And um, it must be a cul-de-sac that the police love to visit because the police car came down the cul-de-sac <laughs> and um, did a UE and came around and uh, sort of got up right behind me, Ivan, and obviously just waited there, running the number plates, um, and then came up really slowly to the side of the car, Ivan, and I rolled the window down, tried to look as nice as possible. <laughs> would you trust that face? No, neither would I. And um, so the, the police officer rolls the window down and says, what are you guys doing? <laughs> Me and my wife in the car. And then it dawned on me how stupid the story is going to be to the police officer. We're here to buy a cat. <laughs> and he says, likely story. And I said, I know, it sounds weird, but <laughs> there's a cat in this property. <laughs> I know it's dark down there, but there's a cat somewhere in there. Um, as a matter of fact, and I didn't even get the words out. Heather says, I'm freaking out! <laughs> and they say, who are you meant to get the cat off? And I gave them the name. Do you have you got a surname? I said, no. <laughs> the story's just getting worse and worse in my head as I'm telling it. Uh, and, he and, uh, and so the police officer asks, do you have a phone number? I said, I do have a phone number. This is how we've been communicating. And so the police officer was kind enough to wait there while they did a search on the house and checked everything out and said, uh, yep, you'll be right, it all checks out. And so I said, would you mind waiting for a little bit while we go in? <laughs> and he says, nah, good luck with that, and drives off. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we got the cat. Another cat. We made it home, okay, it's all good. So uh, this one's name is Blue. Because it's a Russian blue, I don't know what that means, but... It's in my ensuite. Anyway, <laughs> happy Mother's Day to my wife. So there you go. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was my weekend. Girls, thank you. I know. We had to get Sarah to track us on iPhone, find my iPhone, to make sure we made it out alive. So it was all good. I love telling you my stories. I appreciate it. It was worth, it was worth the story. It was worth the story. Well, I'll let, you know. I'll let you know in a couple of weeks how we're going, if both cats are still there, okay? Um, I'll let you know. But the passage of Scripture that Scott so wonderfully shared, thank you for reading that so wonderfully too, Scott. Um, I, that, that's one of my, my favourite passages of Scripture. Anything to do with Jesus and people who don't know Him, I really love delving into because of how... I love watching how Jesus interacted with people who did not know him. And when I, when I read through those particular interactions, sometimes they could be vastly different to how some of us as Christians interact with people who don't know Jesus, In, myself included. Sometimes we can, we can have a mindset of how, how should I respond to someone who doesn't know the Lord. You know, last week, uh, a couple come and caught me in the foyer and said to me, hey, look, um, uh, there is a, there is a, a person, I don't, I don't think I shared this last week, uh, there is a, a person in my work that I've become friends with. And, uh, and this person that I've become friends with, I found out that, uh, that they're gay and uh, they, they want to get married to their partner 
uh, here's a male and the, and the partner's male, of course, and, and, um, and I found out that the, the partner used to be my youth pastor from 25 years ago. And so, um, and so this partner, um, you know, this, this person that I've friended in the office and starting to ask me questions about my life uh, has invited me to come to their wedding and, I, and, you know, and I, 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 I want to go, but there are some Christians saying to me that maybe you should reconsider. <laughs> I said, hang on a moment, do you think it's coincidence that you happen to sit near the person in the office that happen to be now in a relationship with the person that used to be your youth pastor from 25 years ago? You think that's coincidence? Do you think that the Lord has, has, has maybe orchestrated for you to be in their life, to be a disciple of Jesus? Because what I just read, what, what, what Scott just read then from the scripture, what did Jesus say? I did not come to call to righteousness, uh, but sinners to repentance. I did not call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I came to those who do not know me for them to get to know me. And so as, as disciples of Christ, and, and there was a struggle in this couple, but they knew that, they knew there was this inherent love for the people. And they said, well, no, we, we've got to love, not ostracize. We've got to love and have our arms around. Uh, loving does not mean agreeing. We, we as Christians have to learn the art of loving people without agreeing with them. As a matter of fact, we have to learn how to love other Christians without agreeing with them, <laughs> let alone people who don't know the Lord. And so we have to learn the art of loving people without agreeing with them. Jesus was a master of this. As a matter of fact, I, I, from the interactions I see Jesus having, it looks like he loves hanging out with people who did not know him more than people who did, were religious, I should say. Because the religious had a particular rigidity about them that would not allow something new to come in. What God was doing new in that time frame, the religious said, no, it doesn't fit the model and the mechanisms and the religiosity. It doesn't fit the way we believe it needs to fit. We've done it like this for thousands of years. But Jesus comes in and he does something completely different. And they're like, look at this new upstart, wet behind the ears. No one really knows who his father is. We hear rumors that his mother wasn't even married when she fell pregnant with him. He's an illegitimate child, this upstart, and who, who went around and collected people off seashores and told people who were fishing, follow me. And so these rabbi rejects followed him, because that's what they were, right? All the disciples were rabbi, rabbinical rejects and told to go back to work in your father's business, because that's what happens. As a Jew, you would grow up and by the age of five, you would know the Torah. By the age of 10, you would know most of the Tanakh, which is the Old Testament, almost off by heart. And, and, you, and you would apply to go to a rabbi that you or your family believed you wanted to, to use their interpretations to live by. And if the rabbi interviewed you and, and looked at you and you did not make the cut, that if you made the cut, they would say, follow me. But if you didn't make the cut, they would say, go back into your father's business. And here we have most of the disciples doing stuff like tax collecting, fishing, working, i.e. didn't make the cut. And so you can imagine the religious people using that against Jesus even more. You are a wannabe rabbi with rejects as your disciples. Now, don't get me wrong, Jesus had the qualifications of a rabbi in his own right. But the people that he chose did not go through the traditional way that they would go to become a disciple of a rabbi. Jesus chose the rejects. I thank God he chose the rejects. 
<laughs> uh, it's such a clear picture of what Jesus does. He, he uses the foolishness, the foolish things to confound the wise. God doesn't need us to be super highly intellectual or, or look at ourselves and, and only when we get to an upper echelon of society does God use us. No, God uses us at every level of our life, every stage of our life. And I love that God is so, talk about inclusive. God is very inclusive. And here he sits with these, with these people and, and we see that the Pharisees uh, say to, to, to the disciples, hang on a moment, um, why is your teacher eating with tax collectors and sinners? <laughs> Why? Why is he? You see, sometimes we, 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 we're not Pharisees, right? We, we, don't, we don't come from that line, but we can have the pharisaical mindset. How many times have we thought to ourselves, I wonder why so-and-so goes to this place. I wonder why so-and-so has dinner with these people. I wonder why so-and-so behaves a particular way. We, we have questions about things that these, these, these Pharisees were asking Jesus about. And, um, and Jesus heard them and he said to them, well, you know, only sick, only doctors only go to sick people. They don't go to people who are well. Uh, and then he says that I've come not for the righteous, but for those who need repentance for those who need me the most. But let me carry on with that and I want to show you something where it looks like Jesus just, as I've shared this before, Jesus just sort of cuts across what he's doing with something completely irrelevant to the topic, but really it's very relevant. It goes on, it says in verse 14, then the disciples of John, this is John the Baptist, came to Jesus saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Verse 15, and the Jesus said to them, can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them and then they will fast. So he explains to them that I know that fasting is important. He's spoken about it in other areas and other times and I know it's important, but right now, right in this season, I'm here with them. I am the bridegroom. You, the people of Jesus, are the bride. And, uh, and we are in a marriage supper with the Lord. We're in, com in communion with Him, intimacy, intimately. And, uh, and so they're saying, well, there's this fasting you've got to do. You know, you've got to fast. It's a ritual. Not like the fasting we talk about now. Fasting now is we feel led by the Lord to fast. It's good to fast for spiritual things or spiritual reasons or break or, or you know, for, for things to be broken off our life. You can read Isaiah 58 and it talks about it, what fasting's about and how it breaks the chains of our life. But fasting back then was a ritual. You had to do it certain days, certain times, certain moments. And so why are these guys, why are we fasting but your guys aren't fasting? And he says, because I'm here right now, but one day I'll be gone and they can resume the fasting. And then he interjects, in verse 16, something that seems out of whack. He says, no one puts a piece of unshrunken cloth on an old garment for the patch pulls away from the garment and the tear is made worse. Nor do they put new wine into old wineskins or else the wineskins break, the wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined, but they put new wine into new wineskins and both are preserved. It seems like Jesus is just going off on a tangent about something that doesn't have anything to do with why you're fasting and, and why, why you're having dinner with, with, with tax collectors and sinners and why you're doing all these things that you're not meant to be doing or you're, you're not doing the things that you're meant to be doing. But he comes in with this cloth or the patch and the wine story. But really, this is a very relevant part to the story. What's Jesus doing when he is meet, when he's sitting down having dinner with, with the people who did not know him, with sinners and with tax collectors? What's he doing? He is shaking up the rigidity of the religious people of the time. Jesus was shaking up the traditions that had come over and taken over and nullified the power and the, and the Word of God in that moment. What Jesus was doing was plowing the land 
and breaking it up, this dry, desolate land, he was breaking it up ready for a new thing that was about to hit the earth. And that was his spirit and his anointing and his oil and his ways and his words. And so Jesus, when he, when he met with these people and got all the ridicule from everyone else, why are you doing this? It didn't matter because he had a purpose for it. I'm meeting with the sinners and the tax collectors and people who don't know me and aren't religious because they're the ones who need me the most. And so I'm with them. And so then he goes on and says that, well, I know you, you want my, my disciples to do things that they're meant to be doing, but right now I'm with them and they're learning from me. Right now I'm the bridegroom, I'm teaching them, I'm building them. It's okay, we're going to get back to your traditions in a minute, but right now in this minute I'm here. You know, for, for, for some of us, this is what, this is what happens to us is, is our heart bed. The bed of our heart becomes, can become a dry and tough, hard ground. And, and it hasn't been watered in the Word and watered in God's Spirit for a while and it becomes a little hard and a little rigid. And then God comes to do a new thing in you, but everything just bounces off it. It just bounces. Nothing has time to sit and marinate in all of us. And we can go through these seasons where sometimes in the midst of that, God wants to do something completely new. This is why he then goes on and talks about the patch and the wine. This is why he, he brings these two examples. Uh, and you've got to take note that when Jesus uses particular examples, there's reasons why he uses the patch and the wine. There's a, you've got to look at the picture. You've got to imagine in your mind's eye of, of what he's actually showing. You've got to picture what goes on. Before I do that, the Holy Spirit is just talking to me. I, I, I want to pray um, for the mums here who, who have been praying for their families for salvation. Praying for their families for salvation. Who, who are the mums? Can you put your hands up in this place? There's quite a few of you there. Church, if there's some people around who've got their hands, can you just put your hands on their shoulders? We're going to pray for them right now. They've been standing in the gap, really believing for their family members and loved ones. Father, I thank you right now in the name of Jesus. Father, as you've led us to pray this moment, we believe in the power of prayer. We believe in the power of our God because He is a God that is alive. He's not dead in a tomb somewhere, but He is alive. And Father, I pray for every mother and every family member in this place that's believing for a loved one that they come to know you in a very real way, Father. They're believing for their safety. They're believing for their salvation. They're believing for, for your love to touch their hearts and touch their lives, Father. They're believing for healing for their children and their loved ones. And right now we stand with them in the name of Jesus. We declare your power is over them. Your love is over them. Your grace is over them. Your mercy is over them. We pray and we stand with them, with these families in the gap for their loved ones. In Jesus' name, have your way, God. Do what you do best. In your name we pray. And we said, amen and amen and amen. Uh, where was I? I'll tell you where I was. Uh, who is it here that throughout the course of the last couple of weeks, um, I've just got this picture of, of looking over your shoulder. This is, and for those who don't know, th these things are called prof um, prophetic words or words of knowledge. They're parts of the gifts of the Spirit that the Bible talks about uh, where God you know, God can instruct us to, he really wants to talk to someone or a group of people in particular. And, I, and I'm, just, uh, I'm just seeing in my mind's eye, uh, looking over someone's shoulder as they're writing a particular letter to someone that's really important. And whether you're writing it or digitally, but it's coming from the heart uh, and you didn't know how they were going to accept this letter. Is there, was that anyone here today or someone that you know that's done that? Just put your hand up. I want to pray with you. Um, you, you were writing something for, and you didn't know how they were going to accept how are they going to take this? All right, let me pray with you. I, I, I wanted to just let you know that, that um, you just got to do what you felt the Lord has called you to do, and you got to let God do what He's going to do. We do the natural, He does the supernatural. Sometimes when we're led by Him, it doesn't make sense. We don't know what we're doing. We just feel like I've just got to do this. And then when you, when you, when you know it's the Holy Spirit and you have wise counsel around you and you, and you pass it on, you just got to let the Lord do what He does in the hidden place in the secret place, what he does when no one else is watching, when no one else can see, he does things in people's hearts. So all, I'm, all, all, all I believe is the instruction for you is just to make sure it's in the right time, in the right moment, okay, and let, let the Lord do the rest of it. 
Let's pray. Father, I thank you right now, my God, as you've uh, pulled this particular situation out um, to bring uh, a focus on right now, we pray that let it be according to your will and your purpose in the name of Jesus. We pray that you are the God that orchestrates, that brings things, that, that moves things into a fashion that you desire, my God. Let your wisdom prevail and let your power prevail in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And so here is Jesus. He's talking through the cloth and the wine, the patch and the wine. Just imagine for a minute if you've got a, 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 a jacket or a t-shirt, a t-shirt and it's got a hole in it and you decide to patch because, you know, we live in a disposable, we live in a disposable era now. I've got a hole in my t-shirt, I throw it away, I get a $10 t-shirt. This is our mindset. We just, you know, ain't, don't need, nah, gone. Whereas back in these days, it wasn't just a cotton on that you can go to down at Westfield. Uh, you had to patch your clothes in order to make them last longer. And, and what was known to do is you've got a, a, a garment that has already been worn and washed and shrunk into its size. Because for those who don't know, men... Um, <laughs> If you wash something uh, that's not meant, and then you put it in the dryer when it's not meant to go into the dryer, it shrinks, okay? So just read the labels because I've destroyed some of my wife's clothes previously. So just want to let you know, a bit of a tip there. And, um, and so if it, once it's been washed and worn a few times, it shrinks to its size that it's going to stay to. And so if you, get a, if you get a patch that hasn't gone through that process and you put it on an item of clothing that has and you sew it on, then what happens is the new patch shrinks and it tears and makes the hole bigger on the garment. Now just imagine that for a moment. Hole is a certain size, but after, the garment, after it's been put on there, it destroys the garment even more. Just put a pin in that particular picture. Then he moves on to the wine and he says, no one gets old wineskins because they didn't have glass in that, in that regard. Uh, and you couldn't put wine into, into pottery as such when it was fermenting. So they would get new wine and they would put it in new wineskins. Because new wineskins, wineskins were made out of an animal. They were a leather product. And so, so they, when they were new, they would move. They could breathe. They could move. They can expand. And so they would get the wine, they'd put the new wine into the new wine skin. So as the, as the wine fermented, it released gases, which caused it to expand. It caused the leather to move. But, if you, but old wine skin, pre-used wine skin, was rigid. It was hard. It was, it was a little bit more solid. It didn't move. And so if you put new wine that was fermenting into old wine skins, that fermentation process will cause that leather to split and to rupture. Oh, I say rupture, not rupture, not going anywhere. It would rupture and all of the wine would be spilt and you would lose this very expensive wine skin. Now look at those two pictures. What's Jesus saying? What Jesus is saying is, if you get something new and you put it on something old, not only will it not work, but it will destroy the old. Just think of that for a minute. If I get new wine and I put it into an old wine skin, I'm going to end up with the new wine being spilt out and the old wine skin being busted. If I get a new patch and I put it onto an old garment, the patch will become useless and the garment will be destroyed. You see, what Jesus was trying to say to the people through the parable was that there's something new that I'm trying to do in you. And if you don't become pliable and malleable, not only will you not get it, but you yourself will be damaged. Let me say that again. When God is getting ready to do something new in His church, in His people, He takes the time to ensure that people have got enough time to get ready in themselves with what he's about to do and what he's about to release on a corporate level and also on a individual level. God may want to do something new in your life and what he does is he gives you indications and he talks to you and he shows you through his word and he brings people around you 
that rub you the wrong way and he brings circumstances in order to bring pliability to you so that when the new wine comes to your life, you can accept it and carry it and be a carrier of what God is doing new in his church and in your life individually. This is how God works. Now, how does he prepare us? Well, well, there's a few, few ways that God prepares us. I just mentioned a couple of them. Number one is generally he uses people. Generally, God uses people. And generally, here's, here's, here's a tip for you. God uses people that are not packaged the way you want them to be packaged. <laughs> you know, there, there's a story in the Bible uh, where, where a particular lady uh, wanted to have a, have a child, but she was barren, and she's at the front of the church. Um, you know, I think I preached this whole message a, a couple of years back, but uh, she's at the front of the, the temple, and she's crying out to God, but she's so destitute and so desperate to have a child that there are no tears coming out. It's a tearless mourning and groaning of her spirit. And Eli, the priest... The wood duck uh, sees her and thinks she's drunk. She is drunk. So he goes over to her and says, how dare you come to the temple and be drunk at the front of the church? That's disgusting. Now, if I said that to you as the pastor one day, I came in and to worship on a Sunday and you looked like you were drunk. And I came to you and said, how disgusting that you were drunk here. Church on a Sunday morning. Firstly, if you were, I'd be happy that you're in church on a Sunday morning, right? <laughs> Secondly, if you are drunk and you need help, come see us. We'd love to help you, okay? So if there's anywhere you need to be when you're drunk, it's in the house. That's where you need to be. But Eli goes over and he says, imagine how you would feel in front of all the people at the church. It's not like during worship where everything is silent. And he goes, hey, hey, get drunk, get out. He goes, because <laughs> Eli was big, right? The Bible tells us he's a, he, was a, he was a big, stout man. And he, <laughs> how dare you? Well, he would have said it in, in Hebrew, but. And, uh, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he accuses her of being drunk, and she turns to him, and instead of saying, how dare you say this to me? You've just offended me. I'm offended. I need a safe space now to go and sit in this safe space and cry. By the way, when you get offended, nothing happens. You know that, right? You don't wake up tomorrow morning with leprosy if you get offended. If you get offended, nothing really happens. I don't know why in this world that we live in today, we're always trying to not offend people. And offense is the very thing we're stopping. You understand offense, uh, being offended is subjective. Your hairstyle may offend me. My hairstyle may offend you. It's very subjective and it's very finicky and, 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 and pff, it's fleeting. Offense doesn't do anything. Offense is something we choose to take. <laughs> it's, like, um, it's like we sometimes say, no offense, I don't, want, I don't mean to offend you. Well, you can't offend me unless I choose for you to offend me. This is the point of offense. But we've turned the world upside down and we've gone, offense is the very thing we try to stop. We don't want to offend anyone. Which means if we try, if our objective in our world today is to not offend people, we might as well no one talk and do anything ever. Don't paint, don't draw, don't design cars, don't design certain clothes, don't, don't, don't do anything. Don't say anything, don't breathe. For some people, don't even eat anything crunchy because, you know, some of us have got this, this disease, this, this I can't hear people eating in the same room as me disease, right? Don't point at me. <laughs> My wife's pointing at me. That's you. <laughs> have you ever had people when you get on the phone and they're eating while you're talking to them on the phone? Yeah, yeah. I'm like, no, I've got to get off the phone, bro. I can't talk to you. Sorry, I'll, I'll ring me when you're finished your dinner or something. I don't know what's happening. I just can't do it. I just don't know what it is. It's a disease. It's got a name, isn't it? It's got a name. 
Yeah, it's called a fence, but the actual thing, the not being able to, it's something, phobia. <laughs> Pesophilia. That sounds really not cool for, a, for me to be saying off the platform. But this thing of offense, and, and this, this woman could have taken offense to what Eli had said to her and gone, no, I can't believe you said that, and stormed out of the temple. But what she turned was she said to him, I'm here because I desire a son, a child, and, and I'm beseeching God and, 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 and in the depths, believing God for this. And Eli flippantly just says, whatever you're asking for, just have, and he walks off. But it's the very package that she continued to believe God through that caused her to get the son that she got and was blessed with through an ungodly, evil Levite priest, Eli. God blessed this woman because of her belief. And sometimes this is what God does is he brings people around us that, that aren't the package that we think God will bring the blessing to me through. And we just look at the package, not what's on the inside, and don't take what God has for us to learn from this person. And so we need to look beyond the package and see what God is doing. God, this, this difficult person at work, what's going on here? Is this the person you have me dealing with? Is it, is it because you want to show, me lo show them love through me? Is that what it is? I'm not saying that's every case, that's between you and the Lord, but I'm saying don't discard something because it's a little difficult. So God uses people. God uses His Word to get us ready to plow into our, the, 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 the bedrock of our hearts. And he uses his word, as it says in, a, in, in, in Hebrews 5, it talks about washing ourselves, uh, sorry, Hebrews 10, washing ourselves in the water of the word of God, washing ourselves through it. Why does it use the word washing ourselves in the water? Because when you read the word, it's, it's, it's like life-giving river that washes over us. And it starts, what does water do to soil? Water and hard earth, water and hard earth starts to become malleable. It becomes mud. It becomes movable. You can shape it. And when a potter goes and gets clay, what is clay? Clay is malleable earth. And it's shaped. And when it gets hard, water is added to it. And as water of the word is added to the clay of your heart, it is shaped and you are shaped with how God wants us to, into a vessel ready to go to take what God has for us. The other way that God, that God, the way that God uses it is circumstances. God allows us to go through circumstances because it shapes us. Now, I, I look, look, you know, I, I don't necessarily like that God uses people we don't like in circumstances. I don't, I'm not saying this is, the, this is awesome, I love it. It's not nice to go through situations when God's trying to shape us into the people that He's called us to be, His disciples, that He uses people and He uses circumstances that aren't lovely. Now, understand, let me just put a caveat, because you've got to do with Christians, because sometimes we can misunderstand what we're saying. Not bad situations you go through is God ordained. God hasn't sent a bad situation your way just so you can learn something. Because, you know, I've sat with people in a room when I've wanted to slap the Christian who says to someone, yeah, you got cancer because God's trying to teach you something. I don't know what Bible you're reading, but geez, stop reading it. What do you mean? What are you talking about? This is not the God that I serve. The God that we serve doesn't give people sicknesses. He is the healer. He is our deliverer. But life happens. We live in a fallen world where disasters happen, where accidents happen, where people get ill, where things fall on us, where, where, where people get trapped under things, where car accidents, are, where things are just horrible, diseases happen. It doesn't mean God's orchestrated, but what God can do is in that midst, what it is, is us saying, God, I don't understand why this has happened, but it was until I receive my healing or until the circumstances change, I'm going to trust you and believe you and learn from you and be shaped by you right while I'm in the midst of this situation. It's not something God throws on us. It is the way we allow our hearts to be shaped in the midst of the circumstance. That's the difference. This is why we are always blessed. This is why we are always winning at life when you're with Jesus. 
Because no matter what you're going through, Jesus is with you. No matter, what you are, well, no matter what you are facing, Jesus is with you. No matter what horrible situation you're looking at. And I don't discount or take away from the degree of that. Because when I talk to some of us in this place and talk to people who don't know the Lord uh, that are in this place, I see, I see the circumstances and I think, how do you do it? But then you see the disciple of Christ turns to the Word and says, God, I don't understand this. I love you. I don't know why this is happening to me, but I love you. And in the midst of this, I'm going to learn what I need to learn. I'm going to be shaped how I need to be shaped by you. I'm going to be shaped how I need to be shaped by you, Lord. This is what God does. And so when God is about to do a new thing in your life, He prepares your heart. And also in the same way, when God's going to do a new thing in our midst as a congregation, He prepares us. He prepares us. He gets ready. You see, what, why, do you, why do we think that what God's been doing over the last 12 months has been shaping us to a place, making us more malleable to, to understand what it means to go out into the world and be the disciples of Jesus? Not just as a Christian rhetoric, not just as something nice that's written in the Bible, but something that we're actually meant to do individually. Why has he been doing that? Because he's about to bring a new wine of that anointing through this house so that we can be the hands and feet of Jesus in a new way to our local community and beyond, to our suburbs and our state and our nation. That God's gonna do something new through us and He is doing it already. And He's starting to pour the wine, that new wine, that new anointing, that new, that new look and that new shape of being able to go, God, how do we do this? How do we impact our world for you? Not just how do we get a notch in our belt, but how do we actually be Jesus to my neighbor? How do I do this, God? Shape me. Because, you know, it doesn't say it in Matthew, but, but in Luke 5, let me add this sentence. So I didn't put it up on the screen, but the Lord showed me this last night. It says this, and no one, this is the same story, but an added verse. And no one in Luke 5, having drunk old wine, immediately desires new. For he says, the old is better. What's Jesus saying? He's saying most of us are like the rest of us. We're all comfortable with what we know. We're comfortable with what we know. The old wine that I'm partaking in and been doing for, for 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, I know this, I'm comfortable with it. But it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable to change to accept the new wine. And sometimes, you, you may not even know this, but in your own life, God's doing things. And, and you, if you go back through your own life, the last 5, 10, 20 years, you will see the moments where God has shaped you, where there's been a new wine. As a matter of fact, if you know there's been a new direction for you, a new thing that God's doing in your life, you will notice that before you got there, where you've accepted it successfully and walked with it, God shaped you for a few years before you got there. He took time to shape you. If you go back almost every time, you will see how, and you walk with the Lord, you will see how God has shaped and prepared your heart, ready for you to be the person that God is about to change you into being. And so in the same way, corporately, God moves and plies and changes and, and shifts and says, come on, come on, church, get rid of the old wineskin and take on the new wineskin. Be shaped with me through His Word and through the circumstances because this new wine is being poured out. I'm excited about what God's doing through this house. I'm excited that we're in the domestic violence shelters, we're in schools. Uh, uh, Shirley this week was just invited by uh, uh, our, our state member of this area to go to a high level domestic violence forum and to meet some movers and shakers in this arena. You know what's funny is that when we talk about this, um, so, some people come to me and say, hey, 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 how can I be involved to, 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 to teach these people about Jesus? I understand where your heart is coming from, I really do. But this is, the objective is not for us to teach them about Jesus right now and ram Him down their throat. For us, it's come to serve the community. How can we serve you? Tell us what we need to do. You tell, you tell me, you tell me uh, state member, what do we need to do to serve you right now? You tell me, local chapter, what do we need to do to serve you right now? Because what we need to do is we need to, be, we need to get to people's hands first and serve them before we can get to their hearts and then maybe reach their heads. And what we try to do is jam information in their heads, hoping it gets to their hearts and not even come, come close to their hands. <laughs> but what we need to do is come close with our hands out and say, how do I serve you? 
How do I be Jesus to you? Why do I say that? Because that's exactly what Jesus did. He came to serve. He came to break the works of the devil. He came to bring healing and hope. He came to bring life. He, he touched people's lives. He, he fed thousands and thousands of people. He walked into tax collectors and sinners' homes and he loved them. He didn't expect, you realize the most outstanding thing about Jesus' life is that all of the outcasts of the, the religious outcasts of the world loved hanging around Jesus. Notice they didn't love hanging around the Pharisees. You don't read anywhere in the Bible where they loved hanging around the scribes. They loved hanging around Jesus. Why? Because they felt His love and His grace and His mercy. And they never felt that they were demanded to repent. Jesus spoke the truth. Jesus spoke all of the stuff that we know we need to speak about, but He didn't lead with that. He led with walking around and touching them and being with them and sitting with them and getting their kids. Realize all the kids that came to Jesus didn't know Jesus. Their families didn't know Jesus. They weren't religious families. They, 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 they felt safe around Him and He embraced them. The religious people tried to stop these kids, but He said, hey, no, 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 no. Don't stop the kids because this is what it's meant to be like to come to the kingdom of heaven. You're meant to be childlike, uh, in awe, uh, wanting to help. Children always want to help. Children always want to be involved. Give me the knife, I'll cut the tomato and all your fingers, right? But children just want to help. Children just want to, want to be able, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? And then they get to a certain place where they're like, no, I don't want to anymore. <laughs> but you know, that, that age, that five, four, five, six, seven age of just wanting to be helped, that's the children that Jesus is talking about. Let, let them come, let them come. That's the heart we're meant to have. And so when I look at Jesus, that's what I see. Because, you know, in, in Isaiah 43, and many of us who have known the Lord for a little while will know this verse very well in 18 and 19. It says, Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. For behold, I am doing a new thing, and it will spring forth. Shall you not know it? And then he says this, I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. What is he saying? I will do the impossible that no one thinks I can do in places where no one expects for them to be done. And so in the midst of this, this is what I feel God is talking to us about. Not only is he bringing a new wine, but God is gonna open doors and do things in places that we have no idea how we got there, except to look back and go, oh, wow, thank you, Lord. But for that to happen, for that to happen, we need to have a new wineskin being shaped in us, a new wineskin being, being uh, prepared in our hearts through His Word, through people around us, through the experiences we go through, through the relationship of walking with the Holy Spirit to be made malleable. Amen? Let's close our eyes in this place. And you're hearing me speak about being a new wineskin and and having new wine being poured into that wineskin as the Lord instructs for us. But all that starts with a relationship with Jesus. All that starts with a relationship with our God. It starts with walking with Him and, and laying down our lives in covenant relationship with Him. That's where it all starts. It starts in saying to Jesus, you laid down your life on the cross for me to start that covenant and today I lay down my life for you in covenant relationship for, with you to say, I come to you, I'm here with you, I accept you, and I ask that my past is done and I repent of all of my ways in order to be new, a new wineskin. And you might be here in this place and you're thinking, you know what, I, I, I may want to make this decision. I, I, I think I want to do this. I think I want to, to have this as part of my world and and to be able to walk with Jesus so that I know who I'm meant to be and what I'm designed for and why I'm on this earth. Because only the designer has your blueprint. And our God is our designer, the God of the Bible. And so today, while eyes are closed, I'm gonna say this prayer. 
And uh, as I'm praying, if this is a prayer that resonates with you, then I'm going to ask you to, uh, to go to the I Have Decided table at the right-hand side of the auditorium after I say this prayer. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for the hearts that are in this house or hearts that may be hearing my voice, that do not know you in that intimate and real and personal way. Father, let those hearts know that today that they are called, that they are designed, and that they are loved by you. That you are their God and they truly are your people. That they can come to know you and walk with you in the ways that you've ordained and the ways that you've made by first laying down their life for Jesus and asking Him to be their God and they can be their, His people. And Father, I pray that if there are any here today that need to repent of a life that has not been with you, those that need to, to walk away from a lifestyle that does not line up with your word or your pattern or your design for us as your children, then today, my God, I pray that you speak to them by the power of your Spirit. Holy Spirit, speak to them. Knock on the door of their heart. Let them know that today is their day of salvation. Today is their day of redemption. Today is their day of knowing Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. Speak to them, Lord. I thank you for that, Father, in your name. Amen and amen and amen.